Lutheran Church family. Okay, I think we can do a little more, better, a little better. Let's try it again. Good morning, church family. Oh, yes, praise God, amen, hallelujah. Thank you for everybody that's here today. So good to see all of you. Some of you I haven't seen in a while. Some of you I've never seen before. We're so blessed to have you here. And all you people at home, we're so glad you're joining us too. We hope that everybody's continuing to stay healthy and safe in these times. So for those of you who may not know who I am, my name is Erica Furbeck. And I, along with my husband back there, hi, honey, Eric. My little thing, he's so cute. Anyway, um, him and I and our two daughters have been attending RLC for quite some time, actually over 20 years. And yes, um, I serve on the greeters ministry here. My husband serves on the ushers ministry. Our two daughters, Bryn and Amelia, serve in the children's ministry, and they attend Quest. And we're beyond blessed to call RLC our home, and we're so thankful of all of you who we consider family. So thank you. Um, if you're here for the first time with us today, we're so glad you chose to join us. If you'd like to fill out the form in the little welcome uh, brochure and take it to our welcome center off the foyer after service, we, would, we have a special gift that we'd like to bless you with. Also, if anyone has any prayer requests, there's also a form in the brochure for you to share your prayer needs. And then you can just drop it off uh, in one of the offering stands in the back or give it to an usher, or you can take it to the Welcome Center as well. So today we have a very special birthday. Miss Judy back there. Oh, look at her stand up. Praise God. <laughs> Judy, we just want you to know you're a blessing. We love you, and we hope that your day is abundantly blessed today. Love you. <laughs> and, oh. Uh, and we hope that anybody else that's celebrating anniversaries or birthdays this week, we pray that you have a blessed day as well. Uh, digital announcements are available on Facebook, Twitter, in the church app. And also, I kind of skipped it, but our December calendar is on the church app on the, and the RLC website as well. Um, we'd like to remind everyone that our services can be loaded, located on our Facebook and YouTube pages. A shout out to everyone for your continued generosity and giving. Your giving at RLC touches more lives than we could ever really know. It touches lives right here in our city and all over the world. All I can think about this time of year is those Christmas boxes that we all put together that have been making their way to different countries on boats, planes, trains, on donkeys, to get to the hands of children whose lives and hearts will potentially be forever changed, all because of your giving. So thank you. Ways that you can give to the church is you can mail in your giving. You can give at the giving stations located in the back at our exits. You can give online on the website or through our church app. Um, Quest will be recording their Christmas Eve service after second service today. You can see Jeremy for more details. And the Res Kids will be recording their Christmas Eve service after second service uh, on December 19th. So you can see Miss Lynn for more details on that as well. Journey of Recovery, amen, meets this Friday, December 17th at 7 p.m. Uh, contact Pastor Gabe or Miss Judy for more information. This over here, Miss Judy and Miss Judy, we got two. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there's a new Bible study on Wednesdays. Woohoo! Beginning January 5th through March uh, 2nd, uh, the Bible study will take place here at RLC at 7 p.m. The study is based on the book Until Unity by Francis Chan. And you can sign up in the church foyer, or you can see Mark or Lori Kohlbrenner, or you can even email them for more information. The book will cost around 8 to $10, depending on how many we need to order. And if that's uh, of any concern to anyone, you can see Mark and Lori. <sighs> Believe it or not, <laughs> Christmas Eve is just 11 quick days away. <laughs> Who's ready? Anybody ready? Any don't raise your hands because I am not ready. I was just telling my husband, we have so much to do, but it shouldn't be like this. We need to enjoy the season and the hustle and bustle is just, it is what it is, but 
as long as remember, <laughs> we're remembering the season. But we, we will be having our Christmas Eve service on Friday, December 24th at 6.30 p.m. And be sure to invite your family and friends as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. And now could I ask you all to stand as I share an encouraging word with you. I know this can be hard to believe, but sometimes it can be so easy for me to be a real complainer, quick to turn to negativity, and someone who fails to see all the amazing things that God orchestrates in my life every day. I'm so quick to yell at bad drivers when I'm driving, complain about my job when it's not going right, or sometimes I think about sharing a word or two with my kids' coaches when I think I know better. <laughs> but why am I not so quick to praise our Lord and Savior when He does so much for me every day? Why do I not praise Him when I've woken up and been given another day? Why do I not praise him when he's given me that job that allows me to provide for my family? Why do I not praise him when I have two healthy, beautiful daughters? Did I get the opportunity to watch play sports and do the things they love and be coached by qualified coaches? I'm not saying that I never thank God for these things because I certainly do, but I just wish that my praising came as easily as my complaining. Lord, help me be more like what Psalm 34, 1 through 4 says. I bless God every chance I get. My lungs expand with his praise. I live and breathe God. If things aren't going well, hear this and be happy. Join me in spreading the news. Together, let's get the word out. God met me more than halfway. He freed me from my anxious fears. Amen. Let his praise forever be on my lips in everything that I do. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts as we get ready to praise and worship the Lord. Amen. Thank you for that word. And thank you, Lord, that we can come together and worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we're so grateful to be here together, whether we're online or in person, and we just want to give you all the praise and glory for this beautiful day that you have made, so let's sing together. This is the day. This is the day you
can freeze you warm no matter what comes our way we know that death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things in our past or our future can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus so let's praise him today this is the day you've made so I will give you praise whatever comes my way I rejoice in you this is the day you've made so I will give you praise whatever comes my way I rejoice in you this is the day you've made so I will give you praise whatever comes my way I rejoice in you this is the day you redeemed us from the pit.
we thank you for all that you have done, all the things that we see and all the things that we don't see, all the things great and small. worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Good morning, good morning, good morning. We're so glad you're with us. I just want you right now, stop. Collaborate and listen. No, sorry. <laughs> no, I want you to stop. And I want you to think in your head all the great things that God's done for you. You're not even going to be able to get them all in, but just start going through them. Thank you for the breath I have. Thank you for the home I have. Thank you for the family I have, Lord. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for my health. Jesus, thank you for my strength, Lord. Thank you for my peace. Thank you. 
Now let's give him glory for all that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So at this, good morning, good morning, good morning. At this time, if we have anybody who's in children's church, which is grades K through 6, I'd ask that you go out to the children's wing over there and enjoy yourselves. And if we have anybody who's quest age, which is grades 7 through 12, you are more than welcome to head through those doors there. Let's give the praise and worship team a good pound out because they're awesome. And everybody else can take a second to greet each other in whatever fashion you may do that. Good work, guys. Good morning. Reel it in. Catch that bass. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Thank you, everybody who's online with us. Um, unfortunately, for a couple weeks, or but fortunately, it's an unfortunate fortunate, I had, to be, I had to be home, and I was watching service online. And I thank everybody who faithfully tunes in there, and uh, I got to be part of their community. And it was a great blessing. You don't realize the people who are out there. We've got two faithful, faithful people. And there, there are very much faithful people. But we got two people every week from Florida. And I know where they are. They're warm. Um, but they're there watching. And it's, it's, if you do not, if you're not able to come to service, I would ask that you really prayerfully consider to get online because it's a whole little different community in there. And you can just, you know, type to each other, encourage each other. They encourage each other. They, they give amens and hallelujahs. So all you guys who are at home, thank you so much for being with us. Um, you guys are a great blessing. But thank you to the team up there that makes it happen, you know. You know, we thought we started online services just for COVID, but it's a whole different, it's a whole new ministry. And, it, you know, it's something we haven't stopped. And uh, we're grateful. Um, Thank you. I want to say thank you to everybody who was praying for me and my family while we were down and out. I got the C word. Um, I did everything I could do to prevent the C word. Um, I got vaccinated. I wore masks. I did everything I could do. And I still got it. But the enemy didn't take me out. He, he sure tried pretty darn hard, though, I'll tell you. Um, but I, I thank you for the people who prayed, the people who sent cards, the people who text me and my family, the people who sent food. You, just thank you so much for uh, looking after us when I couldn't look after anybody. But I'm going to clear something up. We didn't get it from each other. We know where he got it, and I know where I got it, but we didn't get it from the same place. All right, so... We're together a lot, but we, we, we narrow that one out. But Pastor Jeff is with us today, so uh, welcome back, Pastor. You know, God's amazing. You know, when, when we weren't capable, he made people capable. He had people step up and be uncomfortably comfortable and preach messages that spoke to everybody Amen. because we don't have a leader here. We have a team and we have a leader who leads the team and gives us the vision. That's God through Pastor Jeff. So thank you to everybody who stepped up and did the work they could do so Pastor could recover. Obviously, he's here, but we want to make sure that he's 100% when he comes back and not, not give anything else out there. So uh, continue to pray for him, um, and uh, we'll go on from there. But I've been preparing this message, or God gave me this message, or I don't even know how it all took place. But this, I was sitting in service, and I've got the notes in my notebook. In May, I was sitting here during praise and worship, and God gives me, like when, he, when I feel God speaks to me, he gives me downloads. It's like when you click the button and it goes, and it just pours. That's how God gives me like a lot of the messages that I start. I don't really know where it's going. I don't know what it is. 
he'll just like download this big thing. And when it happens, I mean, like, it's notes and paper and scribble and then try to decipher through prayer later. So in May, I was sitting right there where I always sit because that's where I'm comfortable, I guess, and I just don't read, talk to anybody else. Um, but he gave me this download, and I wrote it all in my notes, and I just started praying about it and seeing what it was all about. And the title of today's message, and we're not going to go there yet, but i just give you, is it, it's all about waiting. It's called In the Waiting. And it's like, oh, okay. But then in October... I was in Pastor Gabe's office, and Miss Judy was in there, and Pastor Gabe was reminding me that we all try to have at least one message ready for the unthinkable, right? Something comes up, we want to make sure somebody's ready and stuff. So I was telling Pastor Gabe, hey, I'm, he's like, you got your message ready? I'm preparing this message. It's called In the Waiting. And then Judy pipes up, and she's like, what? I'm preparing something about the waiting, too. And I'm like, oh, no, she's going to steal my stuff. <laughs> But, so, really, I was supposed to preach this message the week of Thanksgiving. But then, pastor got sick, and he didn't go away, and things changed, and then we all got sick, and then Judy did two weeks of waiting, right? The last two weeks, we weren't about waiting. So, I'm the tale of waiting. All right, so today, we're going to talk about waiting. Judy has set us up with a beautiful found foundation of, of what this is all about. Um, but I'm going to probably just bring not a whole lot of new to you, but definitely some different perspective. All right, I'm just going to ask you to think about waiting in a different way. But before I do, I just want to pray. Uh, dear Lord, we just thank you for being with us today. Lord, it says where, where two or more are gathered, you are here, Lord. And we believe that your Holy Spirit is amongst this place, Lord. I ask that you each give us ears to hear, Lord. Lord, I ask that I make myself just open to your words, Lord, and that I, I be your vessel today, Lord. We also ask that as we're here gathered, Lord, that we can just be thinking and praying about the six states that were hit by the tornadoes, Lord, and all the people and families that are there. Lord, we ask that you be with those cities and communities, Lord, and we ask that churches rise up, Lord, and that they be the life that comes to those communities, Lord, that they're able to share truth to the people who are there and suffering, Lord, and that lives will be changed because you're there in their midst. So thank you today for being with us, Lord, and we thank you for the word that's going to go forth, and we'll be sure to give you all the praise and the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So my question is, is, I'm just a question guy, all right? What are things we wait for? And this is an open forum. I don't want hands raised. You can shout out at me. I just might say, I can't hear you, all right? So what are things we wait for? Delivery guy, delivery guy right? Your son-in-law is a delivery guy. He's busy right now. All right, he's delivering lots of packages. He's be a Santa's elf. All right. Hey, what else do we wait for? We wait in line, right? We wait in line all the gosh darn time. John, you can throw those pictures up. All right, we wait for everything. We wait for doctor's offices. We wait for this. We wait in traffic. We wait at Chick-fil-A because you don't get into Chick-fil-A and go right through the line. There's no way, right? All you mothers wait nine months for a little bundle of joy, Right? <laughs> A little bundle of joy, <laughs> right? And then if there's any veterans in here, there's a motto. In the military, we hurry up and we wait, okay? So me being the military guy, I had to bring that back in here. All right, we do a lot of waiting, okay? But my question is, is what are you waiting for and how are you doing it? Okay? The Bible has several promises and we can quote most of them. You know, if we look at Exodus 20, all right, it says, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. We say this all the time, right? We, we tell it to people, you know what, kids, honor your mother, you'll live a long life. And you will, because it's one of God's promises. And we stand on it, right? And then we can look at scriptures like Romans 10, 9, that says, if we openly say Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart, that God raised him from the death, we will be saved. And we share this all the time because it's the truth, right? If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus died on the cross, we'll be saved. And we share that with people. But you know there's a lot of scriptures in the Bible we don't share with people because we don't want to know. We don't want to face them. We like all the good stuff. But there's also promises in the Bible that there's other stuff out there. 
if we look at um, John 16 and 33, it says, For in this unbelieving world, you will experience troubles and sorrows. Is anyone pulling this one out of their promise box? Right? She's shaking her head back. I don't want nothing to do with this one. It's real. It's just as true as the other promises we just said. Just as true. But we don't often acknowledge it. Right? James 1, 2, which is one of the very first verses that I ever learned in a Bible study. My brothers and sisters, you will have many kinds of trouble. It's God's word. If we know all this good stuff, we need to know about the bad stuff. But that's not what our world's about. We just want to go from joy to joy to joy to joy to joy. Right? Everybody wants to just be happy. But guess what? Sometimes I, I just, I don't know. I don't think that way. I think differently. This may not be what you came to church to hear today. Sorry. And if, yeah. But let's remember that it's in the Bible and it's the truth, and the truth can set us free. We must face the truth. The topic of facing suffering and trials is not a hot topic in churches. Thomas Jefferson even created a Bible. So he took the Bible we have back in the 1800s, cut out all the stuff he liked, pasted it on paper. It was 84 pages long, and he excluded all the suffering and trials out of it because he didn't want to acknowledge it. How many of us are like that, right? He did that. But what we need to remember is the enemy is real, and he's always taking, making plans to take you out and myself. 1 Peter 5.8 says, in, in the easy-to-read version, the devil is your enemy, and he goes around roaring like a roaring lion, looking for someone to attack and to eat. 1 Peter 5.8 says, the devil is your enemy, Oh, it's the same one. I jumped. Oh, oh, that's a different version. I'm sorry. I'm confused. The devil is poised to pounce and will like nothing better to catch you napping. Are we sleepy Christians? Are we, or are we awake, awake and alert? So the question is, if the enemy is out there and he's got plans to come and steal and kill and destroy, what are we doing in the waiting? What are we doing to prepare for these attacks? When I was in the Marines, I served for seven years, we would come off patrol. So we would go patrol, packs, gear, everything we had. A patrol could be 45 minutes, it could be two hours, didn't, didn't matter. But that whole time while we were out there patrolling, we were alert, we were awake, we were aware, because the enemy could be out there. So when you got done with that patrol, the first thing you wanted to do was rest. Because you were so in tune to what was going on, you just wanted to break. But that's not what we did. Right? We had a whole list of works that came up, and they're called lists, uh, it's called priorities of work in the defense. And there's a big long list here of things that we had to do before we could actually rest. Right? And we're gonna look at the ones that are just in the red because I don't want to go into all this like technical stuff with you. Right? But as you can see, this list of works took 20 hours to complete. So you got done with your patrol and then you had 20 hours of work ahead of you still. Sound like fun? Not at all, right? But what's the very first thing? When we got done, what did we redo? We set up security again. We got ready for the attack. Guess what? We as Christians have to be ready for the attack. We can't be at the top of the mountain and be in all and not expect something to happen. Because we have top of the bottom, top of the mountain moments, and we have bottom of the, in the valley moments. Okay? Those aren't the places we want to live. All right? We want to be there. We want to have a defense set up all the time. So we have to establish security. Then part of that security was, is if this is where we were, and when we would set up our defensive position, usually we set it up in a place where nobody else wanted to be because that was the safest place to be. So on the edges of swamps, in the thicket, in the thorns, on top of hills, mountains, because nobody wanted to get there, and that was the safest place to be. But if I was here, what we do is 200 yards out in front, we'd put observation posts and listening posts. Those were our early, that was our early detection. They were out there 
to detect if the enemy was probing us or not. You know what? We have to be listening and observing all the time as our defense. Always being aware of our situations and surrounding of what's going on. Then, on top of that, when we jump down to the next red, red bullet, prepare our defensive positions. Most of the time when we set up a defensive position, it was a hole that was chest deep. And guess what? The hole didn't get there by itself. So we had to dig it. This was on top of doing all the work that we already did. But I knew that if I was in that hole, it was the safest place I could be. So when I dug that hole, I dug it good. <laughs> right? Then we jumped down, and after we take care of all these other things that are there, it was conduct maintenance. Conduct maintenance is taking care of my gear. If my rifle doesn't work, I'm no good in the fight. So after that patrol, after going through all the mud and swamps, I want to make sure that my barrel's clean, that my ammunition loads, that everything's good, oiled, and ready to go. That's the way we should be as Christians. And then, what's it say? Then I start to take care of it. Everything else was about everybody out there. It was about protecting my team. The last thing I did is I took care of myself. I took care of my hygiene, right? Really what that means is I changed my socks. Because if you don't take care of your feet, your feet won't take care of you. All right? And when they're all wet, mushy, and gush, you, you're no good to your team if you can't walk. You're actually a hazard. Okay? So we took care of ourselves. Then we ate. Then we rested. And then you know what we did? We went back out on patrol again. <laughs> It's a long process. And you're like, why do you share all this military stuff with me? You know what? Because we have to have a mentality like this. Because we fight an enemy who is just like the enemy that I would face if I was in the military. An enemy who wants to destroy me. An enemy who wants to ruin it. So what are we doing to prepare? What are we doing in the waiting? It's very important to think about. We need to be prepared, not scared. Let me say it again. We need to be prepared, not scared. Amen. All right, I'm going to talk from personal experience. Me, my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, we do projects once in a while. All right, we'll all help each other do a project. The thing I hate the most, and I hate it, I'll show it on my face, I'll show it with body language. I get into a project, and I've got to run to the hardware store four times. I'm miserable. <laughs> I dislike being in the middle of the project. Oh, I forgot the gasket. Oh, I forgot the joint glue. And I'm going, I waste more time going to get stuff than I do fixing what I'm supposed to be fixing. I wasn't prepared. All right? The other thing is, is when I'm grumpy like that, my wife likes to take care of me. So she'll either make me some brownies or some cookies. But then she's not prepared because there's no eggs. Right? So how many of you got into where you're baking before, like Christmas cookies are coming up? And you got all the dough and everything, and then you go to crack the eggs, or, and there's nothing there. We weren't prepared ahead of time for what we were about to face or the mission we were about to accomplish. So we need to be prepared. We have the intelligence. The battle is going to come our way. It would be in our best interest to prepare for the fight before it comes. There are only, being unprepared, is, it's just an awful feeling. The key to being prepared, though, is being blessed by what's already been shared here at RLC. Pastor gave us the anchors of hope. Thank you. One person's excited about it. Right? He gave us the anchors of hope. And the first thing in being prepared is acknowledging and knowing that God's there. Even when he feels like he's not there, he's there. We stand on that good, that good life anchor and that foundation. You know, we had the opportunity, Mark Colbrenner shared with us about the armor of God and how we can be prepared before the fight even comes. Right? Judy shared with us messages on waiting and how to wait. Today, I'm going to give you the ammunition. Right? Because we want to have an offensive way to do it. So what I'm going to share to you is I'm going to give you some scriptures that can help you bring the fight and persevere through it. The first and foremost thing is we need to bring God and the name of Jesus to everything we do. Amen. Now think about it. How often... Do we bring God and Jesus to everything we do? I don't. I'm going to be quite frank with you. There's lots of things I try to do myself. Usually that's when I'm not prepared. 
But if we bring God in the name of Jesus to everything we do, that's the first step in, pres- in preparation. That's that early defense. That's setting up that security that we talked about in the very first bullet of priorities of work in the defense. Bringing God to the fight. We're not fighting alone. We already bring in somebody who holds the trophy, who's got the belt, who's already won the battle, and he's already with us if we choose to have him there. But how many times do we leave him out? Romans 8.31 says, If God is for us, who can be successful against us? It's right there. We've got the truth. The truth can set us free. If he's with us, we win. Let me say that. We win. I don't like to lose. (laughs) It's the key. We've got to have him with us. We must have confidence that God's presence is with us. How do we have that confidence? How are we reminded? Through Hebrews 13.5. We must build these scriptures into our hearts. It says, don't be obsessed with getting more material things. Be relaxed with what you have. Since God assured us, I will never let you down. Never walk off and leave you. You can boldly quote, God is there, ready to help. I am fearless no matter what, who or what can get me. Bringing God to the fight is the very first part of it. It's our security. The word tells us God will never leave us or forsake us. That's God's part. But what are we doing in the middle of the storm? Think about it. There's some people out here right now, they're not waiting for the storm, they're in the middle of it. And you know what? The waves are crashing, the water's deep, and the current's heavy. But if we remember, at that same time, Jesus reached down and he grabbed Peter and he pulled him out. And you know what? You need to believe that wherever you're at right now, God can do that same thing for you. He can reach down wherever you are and pull you out if we call upon his name. And we need to remember that. He is never going to leave us. He's never going to walk off. We're not on our own. He's in the fight with us. He's the strength behind us. God will do his part Will we do ours. We have a personal responsibility as we're reminded in James 4, 7. It says, so submit yourselves to the one true God and fight against, to the one true God and fight against the devil and his schemes. If you do, he will run away in failure. When we, heard the, when we hear the word submit, what do we think? Just like talking about trials and battles and storms, submission or surrender isn't a church hot topic. People don't want to hear about turning their whole life and everything they have over to God. I look at it this way. This is the illustration that God gave me a long time ago. All right? Everybody's seen a school janitor, right? School janitor's got a set of keys that's like this big. They walk down the hallway, you know he's coming, click, clink, click, clink, click, clink. Right? Surrendering or submitting is taking that ring or keys and giving it to God and allowing him to open up every room inside of you. Giving him the whole keychain. But you know what? There's a lot of us, myself, I'm going to keep this key and I'm going to keep this key and I'm going to keep this key. And God's not getting in there. That's not surrender. That's not submission. Guess what? If we open the door, God's got the master key and he can get in anywhere we want him to if we allow him. And that's, what, that's the key, is being submissive and allowing him to be there. Being submissive is not weak. Being submissive is being obedient. Being submissive is following the plan that God's got for you. When you're following the plan that God's got for you, that's going to steer you down what he's got. And it's not saying it's not going to be hard it's, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but you know what? If God's plan is hard, I'd rather be on that plan than my own because I've been there before and it didn't lead to anywhere. When we look at these words of of submission, I've got a list of synonyms here. 
And often we change words and what they mean because we look at things. We look at this word submit, all right? Acknowledge, agree, defer, abide, humor. God's not asking us to humor him. God's not telling us to fold. He's not telling us to cave. That's not in his demeanor, all right? What God's asking us to do or, or what we do or as a, pe- a person, some of us, including myself, we acknowledge God and then we just move on. Or we defer to God when everything else is, has ran out. Or we appease God just to get what we want. We don't work for a God who's a genie in a bottle. When we really look at what submit means, it means to stop trying or fight or resist something. To agree or to do or accept something that has, we've been resisting or opposing. Now, have I turned over every key of my life to God? No, but each day I'm trying to give over more. And that's the goal. Each day, becoming more Christ-like. All right? And then we look at surrender, to give up completely or to agree, forego especially favor. We've really, really, really got to think about where we are. If we acknowledge God and we submit to him, there's a promise that comes along with this. All right? The promise is the enemy will flee. Everybody here said they don't like the trial and like the fight. But if we've got the answer to the fight, then why aren't we doing it? Now, I'm not saying it's an easy road. But each day, we should be taking one step down it. Becoming more Christ-like each day. Because when we submit, the enemy will flee. That's the key. Right? So in preparation for the battle or the storm or the trial, we must know two things. We must know and remember that God is with us. That's, that's the foundational anchor. Know that God is with you. Know that God is with you. Then we must submit to his ways, and the benefit is the enemy will flee. The time to study for the test is not in the middle of the test. That's right. It's called cheating. <laughs> if we don't prepare, we get in these, these test trials and storms, and then we're just trying to fight our way out because we don't have anything to stand on. All right? What we need is we need ammunition. In the waiting, right, we've got the intelligence, the battle's going to come. In the waiting before it comes, we need to be storing ammunition. We need to be putting God's treasures, his truths into our hearts. So when it hits us, we're ready and I can throw something right back at it. Okay? So in the waiting, we prepare for battle. We must be practicing, preparing, and studying. Right? I don't know how many people here have ever had the opportunity to take a cruise, right? Carnival Cruise Lines, Royal Caribbean, whatever you may be. All right? I've had the opportunity to go on a couple relaxing cruises, and then I've had a couple of times where I went on some military cruises, which were much different, all right? But the first thing you do, the very first night you're on the cruise ship, you have to do a lifeboat drill. So you go to your room, and they say, evacuate, evacuate, or something along those lines. You go to your room, and you get this life jacket that's absolutely ginormous, and you strap it on, and then everybody musters together, right? And everybody gathers together. It's the silliest, most ridiculous thing at the time. People are there snapping selfies and pictures because they all think it's cute and pretty. What's it for? It's for preparation in case the ship goes down, right? They practiced. They knew what to do. Could you imagine if the whole ship didn't know what was going on when the ship went down? It'd be chaos. They made it a priority to practice. They made it a priority to be prepared. All right. Unfortunately, the other picture is a scene that we see way too much. That's a school lockdown, which has become normal to our students. There's no way this should be normal. There's no way. But in preparation for the enemy who will come in, steal, kill, and destroy, our students have to know what to do. And this is the safest thing to do. And they can do it like this. They're preparing, right? That's what this is all about. They're prepared for the emergency situation if it happens. 
Another way to prepare for tests, trials, temptations, storms, and battles is to store God's truth in our hearts so we can easily access it when needed, all right? Because these are coming. But I think there's a lot we can learn from bison. And everybody's like, how can you learn something from bison? And I didn't know this until a couple weeks ago, all right? But bison deal with storms all the time. And the way they do it is pretty cool. And I learned this from a guy named Rich Froning. And Rich Froning is a nine-time CrossFit champion, all right? So he's got pipes. He's like one of the fittest guys ever on the face of the earth, all right? He is a Christian, and this is biblically related. He's got shirts that say into the storm on it and everything. But what he does is he has a bison farm where he raises bison for jerky and beef or meat and everything, and he sells it. But the way, the way he talks about bison and the way that they go in the storm is pretty interesting. He said, when bison are up against the storm, they turn and meet it head on. Is there anybody here who turns and meets most storms or trials head on? No, we like to go the other way. It's like, oh, there's trouble there. All right, I'm going to go down this road. There is trouble, right? They meet it head on. All right? They square their shoulders and they brace against the power of the storm. How many people heard the storm last night? There was some power in that storm, right? There was lots of wind last night. They just square up. They put their heads down. And most importantly, they always move forward. They don't go backwards. Instinctively, they never try to avoid the hardship. They charge straight ahead to limit the pain they will experience. Life sends us challenges. Choose your response. Choose to respond using God's truths. We can learn a lot from a bison. In Quest, a couple years ago, God gave us this series to do. It's called, the name of the series was Who You Say I Am. And all it was was biblical truths that counteract the lies of the world. In this picture, which is still, this wall is up over there, all right? We've got all these truths of who God says we are. We're free, we're forgiven, we're victorious. And I encourage our students to take a picture of this and have this with them everywhere they go. This week, I've passed this picture on to somebody who needed it in their time of storm. Because if they can't pull it out of their heart, we got to have a tool where they can pull it from. All right? So these are just some truths there here. But I'm going to tell you how we use these truths. These truths aren't all the truths there are. But we can fight a lot of the battles and storms we have with them. All right? The enemy didn't tempt Adam and Eve to murder to steal or to lie. What he did is he tempted them to question God's word. He's not going to tempt us with the big things. He's going to make us question if God's word's true or not. I'll give you an example. Whatever trial you may have, there's many of them out there, but let's just take the medical example, right? So many years ago, my mom got cancer. All right, she had breast cancer. She's totally healed by, by God, and um, thank you. Um, but what, what did I choose to stand on? Where was I at? I could have just said, yep, mom's got cancer. This is really, really bad. What am I going to do? How am I going to No. I pulled the promise out. I pulled the truth out. And I pulled out Isaiah 53 that says, by his stripes, she is healed. And every single day, I said, by his stripes, she is healed. By his stripes, she is healed. By his stripes, she is healed. And then she was. And guess what? You're looking up there. That one's not up there, is it? Right? Because you know what? There's so many. Okay? But that's just another one. That's why I threw it in there. We have to remember God's word can take care of all the challenges we face. We just got to bring it to the fight. We must hang on to his truth knowing that healing and truth is there. I'll give you another example, okay? In these church walls, we had a parishioner who was here who um, needed a kidney. He was in kidney failure. He needed to have a kidney replacement. And so my children found out because he was their res kids teacher. And every single night, they would lay down to sleep and they'd say their prayers and they'd pray for this individual and then they got a kidney. 
and then days went by, and weeks went by, and months went by, and there was no change. The person's health would be up, the person's health would be down, the person's health would be good, the person's health would be bad. And then, two years later, I received a phone call. And on the voice, they said, can I speak to Elena? What? This is my phone. How dare you? This is my daughter. What do you want? And it was this gentleman. He said, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being faithful with your prayers. Because I'm going to get the kidney that you've been praying for. Now, I know that there's several other people in this church who were praying for that same individual. I'm not, my kids aren't taking all the credit. But as a team, we can do this all together. Amen. But think about this in the life of a, a young child, right? My daughter's under 10 years old when this has taken place. So she sees her prayers answered. She sees how being steadfast and praying for somebody can work out, right? She was spoiled because she saw the fruit of it. Are we always going to see the fruit? No. But is that going to stop you from doing what you know is going to work? That's the question. Right? But inside a young child like that, that taught them lessons for the rest of their life. And we can all do that. Right? We have all made mistakes and fallen into temptation and asked God for forgiveness. But how many of us continue to beat ourselves up after we ask for that forgiveness? I'm no good. God doesn't love me. I screwed up big time. But the thing is, if we pull out a truth, right? Look at just on this wall. I am free. I am forgiven. I am loved. I'm a masterpiece. That's not what the enemy is telling us. He's telling you, you're no good. You're useless. God can't use you. When we ask for forgiveness from God, it's as far as the east is from the west. Do we understand how far that is? It's immeasurable. It's gone. Wiped out. Kupupu. The only one who brings it back is us. But we bring it up because we let the enemy get back in. But if we've got these truths stored up in our hearts, we have something to combat them with. And when he starts to get traction, we can wipe the traction right out if we pull out a truth. Having the word stored up in our heart for times of struggle, at times of pain, and times of trial is a key. We've got to study before the battle comes. Now I'm going to give you an example in my life, and this story is going to take a little bit of time here to, to figure it all out. But this February, I... Um, God amazed me, and I had the opportunity. I have a, I'm, a, I'm a physical education teacher. Um, I love what I do. God's given me a good occupation, um, but he's given me a more important calling. Um, I love what, what, he, what he's provided me with, and I've had a job for 14 years. I was secure there, made good money, did a whole little work to get a whole lot, had it really easy, <laughs> honestly, but me being me and God knowing who I am, he had more for me. And over those 14 years, I had only applied at two other places where I felt God had directed me to apply. And this job came up. Um, it was a high school job, so I only had to work with high school students. It also had something that I'm passionate about in it where I enjoy teaching lifeguarding, first aid and CPR, and I would be in charge of all that. So God said, you know what? You, I felt in my spirit that, I need to apply. And I did. And in February, I had to do an interview. But because of COVID and everything, I had to do a Zoom interview. So um, preparing for the interview and stuff, I couldn't do it at my house because my house is a little noisy with all the kids and everything. So I decided to do it at my office here at church. So I'm here at the office, and I'm in a shirt and tie and jacket and sneakers because nobody can see my feet because it's Zoom. And Mickey sees me and she encourages me and while she's in the office and says, you know what, you're going to do good, you're going to you do great. And it lifted me up. And as I was walking around the church before the interview, I walked into Quest and uh, was just like going through notes and rehearsing the answers in my head and stuff. 
And the enemy just punched me in the face. He said, this job's not yours. You're not qualified. You don't know the answers. You've been riding easy road. This is real PE over here. You've been doing fake PE. Seriously, this is what I, this is what I felt. He'll find any way to get at you, to make you feel inadequate. He will. And I just, from being at this high point of Mickey's encouragement to now, like, we talk about mountain and valleys, I was, I was, I was like, oh, my goodness. What am I going to do? And I turned. And you know what was in front of me? This wall. And I looked. And it said, you are complete. You are capable. You have everything you need. You are chosen. Think about what that did. That got my spirits way up here. And I went in that interview, and I'm going to tell you what, I crushed it. God, get, let me crush it. All right? I'm going to tell you how he let me crush it, okay? You're like, how do you, what, what do you, how do you know you crushed it? Because you know what? He gave me favor. He gave me favor. There's eight people there. I never met any of them. However, one of them, the husband, happened to be a close friend with my wife. That's favor. All right? I got ready to answer my first question from my colleague who I work with now. Like, you're going to find out in the story I end up getting the job. However, right, the lady I work with now, she said, I got this question for you about PE standards and all this stuff. And she goes, I'm not going to ask it. She goes, I've got a deaf dad and a deaf mom, and my daughter's hard of hearing. Show me what you know about sign language. How would you incorporate sign language into your classes? She goes, can, can you sign the alphabet? And I said, do you want me to sign with one hand or two hands? Let's go A, B, C. D, right there, because you know what? God gave me favor because I trusted him. And you know what? He can do the same thing for you too. So I went through this interview and it went well, right? However, like three weeks later, I still hadn't heard anything. So you go from this mountaintop to where are we, right? And you're going to see that this ship takes a long time to sail. This whole process went from February to May. So in this thing, I, had, I did a Zoom interview, I had to do another Zoom interview. I actually had to go in and teach a lesson to a bunch of students I had never met before, which is really, really awkward, all right? And then I had to do an interview with the superintendent. So I did the interview with the superintendent, and this is May now. And um, he said, we're really, really like you. We really want you to come on the team here. And this is what you'll make, and this is your benefits. However... At the beginning, God told us what I need to make and what my benefits would be. So he came to the table and he said, this is it. I'm off, he's offering me the job that I want, but he's not giving me everything that God told me I'm going to have. Have you ever had what you wanted right in your hands and had to say no to it? It's awful. It's terrible. But God is going to give you what he tells you he's going to give you if you trust him. So I had to tell them no. The job I wanted, the job I believed God was going to give me, I had to say no to. And they're like, okay. And he, he said, let me go see what I can do. So two weeks later, comes by, he comes back with another number. And I said, I'm sorry, but I can't do it. I know what I'm supposed to get. I know my value here. Now let's remember, I had a job that was very secure where I was at. I had no reasons to leave. It was really easy. I got paid really, really well. Okay? But I go to this job where God set me up for, to do what I wanted. Listen, this is, this is for somebody in here. Just because we think of this, this world of where we go up and up and up, all right? God took me from a job where he told me this is where you belong, but my pay was less than what I was making. But understand that if you're doing what God has for you to do, that's okay, because he's going to take care of you. And when I say less, significantly less, because you know what? We got to stop chasing the dime and do what God's got for us to do. Because I can tell you, he'll take care of you if you put your trust in him. Okay? So, 
Again, he told me this number. I said, I'm sorry, I've got to decline. I really, you don't understand how bad I want to be here. However, this isn't what God's got for me right now. I know what he's got. So then I countered and I said, this is what I need. And on the spot, he said, no, we can't do that. Okay, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate everything. Thank you for wanting me on your team. But this is it. And then I went and I was mad. <laughs> I was mad. And some of you guys know how mad I was. <laughs> all right. And I was mad. I'm not going to lie. What am I going to lie about? I was mad. I was disappointed. I was like, God, you set all this up. They want me. Why not? And I questioned God. But you know what? God can move up mountains and God can open doors. Because after I said no and gave them the final offer and they said no, I, I moved on. I started to set up a whole new plan, know what God had for me to do. Two weeks later, the superintendent called me and he said, we want you on our team. We're going to give you this and we're going to give you this and this is exactly what you asked for. Now remember, if God can do that for me, he can do that for you. There's no better place to be than exactly where God has for you to be. If you remember the last message that I taught in here, it was called, not my will, but your will. Well, I had to live it out. And you know what? It was no fun. <laughs> but I've been where I'm at for 14 weeks and I couldn't be happier. And it's not about money. It's about, my wife will tell you, I'm a different person. Because I'm not, I'm not caught up in what I was caught up in before. God brought me from glory to glory. And you know what? That's not always in the money. That's in doing what he has for you to do. Okay, so there's a lot that's there in that. And I don't tell you this story to pat myself on the back. I tell you this story for encouragement for you. Because if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. We have a God, we serve a God who moves mountains and opens doors. What do you need done? What do you bring into the table? Because he's there. We already learned that. He's there and he wants to fight with us. Not fight with us, fight for us. You get that right? All right. So I share, like I said, I share this story because I want you to know that a God is a, a, God, a man of his word and that he's faithful. And that we're in the waiting or we're in that holding process. He's working. But we must know that he's present. We must submit to his plans. And we must have scriptures stored up in our, in our hearts to get through that waiting. In the Bible, there's many, many stories about waiting. I'm going to share one of them with you today. Now, it's probably a story you're familiar with, but I call it the two for one or the buy one, get one. Right? And you're like, you'll see at the end what it's all about. I'm going to, you have, you've heard this before. My hope is, is that I share it in a different light. And all today is, is nothing new that you've heard but all it is is a different perspective, okay? So this is about the woman with the blood. This is Mark 5, 25 through 29. And we're gonna break it down a little bit here. It says, now the crowd that day, now in the crowd that day was a woman who had been suffering horribly from continued bleeding for 12 years. Does that sound fun? Anybody bleeding for any amount of time sounds no fun. This woman had been bleeding for 12 years. It also says that there was a crowd and really, it's important to understand why the crowd was there and what was taking place, okay? So to give a little bit of reflection backwards, Jesus is part of this crowd. Jesus just came across the sea in a boat, and he landed at the water's edge. But what we need to understand is prior to that, he was on the other side of the sea, and what he was doing, he was releasing the demons from the man who was there and sending them in the pigs, and the pigs were running off the side of the cliff. Everybody recall or have a little bit of an idea there, right? So they had heard what Jesus has done, and all the other healings that he had done. So when he came to the water's edge, everyone was like, I want mine. Right? Because we do that. And I personally look at Jesus as like a rock star, and everybody wants to be around him. So when he came, everybody engulfed him. So that's why the crowd's there. All right? And that's why this woman is, is around this area. She's in this crowd. She's part of this crowd. All right? So the other thing we need to know prior to this, before this jumps in, is when this crowd gathers, there's a man who comes up to Jesus and says, his name is Jairus, and he comes up and he says, my daughter is dying at my house. 
I need you to go there and heal her. So Jesus had a plan before him is what he's, he's like, sure, let's go. And him and his boys, the disciples said, and they started, they started marching. They were going to the house. The goal was to heal this girl. So think, he's already in that mindset. I'm going here. I'm going to take care of this girl, right? This crowd's there. They're all like, hey, me, you, wow, right? Think about it. Word pictures. We got we to picture this stuff, right? So she had been bleeding for 12 years. She had endured a great deal under the care of various doctors. So she's like us. If we don't like what we hear at one doctor, we go to another doctor. If we don't get the answer there, we're going to go somewhere else, right? So she went and went and went, couldn't get healed. It also says that she spent everything she had. So how important was her healing to her? Very. She gave up everything she had. Think about how desperate she is. Think about her condition. She'd been bleeding for 12 years. Is this a big, strong woman or is this a weak, frail woman? Somebody who's desperate who will do anything to get what they've got, right? So she had been there. She spent everything she had over those 12 years. She was discouraged. She was desperate. And then um, it continues to say here, when she heard about Jesus' healing power, she pushed through the crowd and came from behind and touched his shawl. So think about it. This crowd's there. This crowd is going. Jesus is on the mission to go heal this girl. This woman who is bleeding, right? Now let's go back, really. This woman is deemed unclean. She can't be amongst people. Technically, she can't be in the crowd. And if she got caught, she could die. So me, my word picture, right? I got the crowd walking. She's back here. She's like, hey, what's going on? Holy cow, that's a lot of people. And she's here in chatter. He's going to heal this girl. He just released a demon. And she's like, hey, what's up? And so he says, he's going to heal somebody. And then the light goes off. Boom. This is my chance. I'm going to take it. So this weak, frail woman, this big crowd. When I, look, when I picture this crowd, right, there's only two ways I picture it. I picture it as a rock star walking down with his whole group of bodyguards around him and everybody trying to just get their touch, right? Or I picture it as the president walking the secret service around and not letting anybody get to him. Good pictures, right? But this woman said, you know what? It's worth it. And it says, what'd she do? She got in the crowd. When she heard about his healing power, she pushed through the crowd and came up from behind him and touched his prayer shawl. So frail woman, now think, who, if she gets in this crowd and touches somebody, can be sentenced to death because she brought uncleanliness to them. So now she's risking her life. Big crowd, and she gets in there, and she's like, let me get at him. Let me get at him. And she may have been down low because she didn't want anybody to see her because she was unclean and she didn't want to get in trouble. Or I say this, there's other, there's other versions that say she touched the hem of his, of his garment. Or it says she touched the tassels of his shawl. It means she was down low. How'd she get there? She's weak and frail. Me? I think she got knocked down. Pastor Gabe thinks she was hiding from herself. We don't know. Whatever works for you. My point is, you know what? Wherever she was at, if she was on her knees, if she was down low, she was laying on the ground, she said, you know what? I want him! And she reached, and she said to herself, what we see in the next thing, it says right there, she kept saying to herself, if I can touch his clothes, I will be healed. If only I can touch his clothes, I will be healed. If only I can reach and fight through the crowd, I can be healed. What are you believing for? What are you reaching out to God for? What are you saying, if only God, if only God, I can get to you, you're going to do this. For her, it was healing. For somebody else, it might be some, a family restoration. For somebody else, it might be physical healing. It might be a relationship. What's your if only God? Because you know what? If he'll do it for her, that gives me hope he'll do it for me. 
are we reaching? Are we in desperation? Are we going after it? We really got to think about those things. So this lady put her life on the line to just touch him. She had such hope, belief, and trust, right? But let's rewind. What did she know about Jesus? Go back. It says there, the crowd that day, a woman was there. When she heard, right? When she heard about Jesus' healing power, she pushed through the crowd. To me, that means this is the first time she'd ever heard about it. The very first time she was willing to lay down her life to get there. How many times we opened up our Bible? How many times we heard about Jesus? We're not putting our lives on the line, me included. But the very first time she put her life on the line to get what she needed. And you know what? God provided. And he'll do the same for you. That's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So then the scripture goes on to say, for she kept saying that if I only touch him, I will be healed. And as soon as her hand touched him, her bleeding immediately stopped. Immediately. Now, I've been around a lot of blood, all right? If it be through being in the military, if it be through being a lifeguard and all the stuff that I've done, lots of blood. I've never seen blood instantaneously stop, ever. But she knew it immediately stopped, right? And she knew, and then, for she could feel her body instantly being healed from the disease. Scripture goes on to say that when she touched him, Jesus felt power leave him, and he knew somebody touched him. Now think about it. We're talking about this rock star walking down the thing, bodyguards, everything else, secret service around him. Everybody's trying to bump, touch, get just, I've touched him, right? I went to a Toby Mac concert. My kids, all they wanted to do is touch Toby Mac. Right? If I only touch him, like, what's he going to give you? Right? He's not going to give you a whole lot. It's not like you're, all I want to do is touch him. She touched him, what happened? So all these people trying to get there, touch him, to get something from him, be around him, and he felt her touch. Out of all of them. But why? Because her touch had heart, desperation, hope, belief all connected to it. And it drained from him, and he knew that she had been there. It goes on to say in Mark 534. Then Jesus said, daughter, because you dared to believe, your faith has healed you. Go with peace in your heart and be free from your suffering. Amazing. Absolutely amazing that somebody can hear about Jesus' power. How much time do you even think went by? From the time that she first saw the crowd and heard what they did to the time that she said, I'm going for it. I'm not imagining this is like days. I'm not imagining this is hours. I'm like, this is minutes. But she had it deep down inside her. This is what I need. This is what I want. We all need it. But are we going for it like that? Are we laying out? She had fought this battle for 12 hard years. And now she had received the healing. But this is where we get the buy one, get one. Jesus didn't stop there. He carried on to Jairus' house. And he got there, and he healed his, his daughter as well. So guess what? This is what I'm saying. God can make a detour for you. He will stop and meet you right where you're at if you go after him. We often think, oh, he's too busy. He's doing what? No. He will stop for you because he loves you that much, just like he stopped for this woman. Amazing. Absolutely blows my mind. But what happens is, is quite frankly, Jesus isn't our first resort. He's our last resort. We go to everything else there is, and then we come to him. We need to make him our first resort and not our last. Go to him with everything. So as we close today, we need to remember some of our takeaways that we've got. We must remember and know that God is always with us till the end of the age. He will never leave us or forsake us. We must submit to his ways 
And remember that with that submission, there's a benefit. The enemy will flee. We must store his truths in our hearts and use them as ammunition to fight the battle when it comes at us. When something hits you in the face, be able to pull something out and be able to fight with it. And during this time, we must trust this timing and know that it's always perfect. I didn't want an interview process to take a bunch of months. This woman didn't want to be sick for 12 years. But God gave us right what we needed, right when we needed it, because this timing is perfect. So if you're here today or you're at home, and I, what I'd like you to do, and before we do the salvation prayer, I'd just like everybody to close their eyes and just think, if you're here today, and I want to address the people who are in the middle of the storm. The waves are high. The current's heavy. If that's you today, just raise your hand so that I can pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much, Lord. We thank you, first of all, that you are God, that you are King of kings and Lords of lords, Lord, and that you already have the victory. Lord, I thank you for each individual who's in here who raised their hand, Lord, that they're in the trial, that they're in the storm, Lord, and that they're fighting it. And Lord, that the current is heavy and, and there is just weight upon their shoulders, Lord. But I ask right now, Lord, that you be with them, that you be the strength that gets them through the day, Lord, that you give them the truth, Lord, that, that will help them prevail that when the negative thoughts and circumstances come into their life, Lord, that they can replace them with your truths and promises, Lord. And Lord, that they be patient and trust your timing so that they will see the victory inside of the trial, Lord. And Lord, I, I thank you for the testimonies that are gonna come from each one of these battles, Lord. And I thank you for the maturity that's gonna come from them as well. And we'll be sure to give you all the praise and glory and honor. Amen. Now, if there's anybody else there who doesn't have that Savior to fight alongside them because they've never accepted Christ in their hearts. There's nothing like going into a battle alone. But we don't have to do that. We've got a Savior who wants to fight right alongside us. And if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, I just ask that you slip your hand up and I'll pray salvation prayer with you. And I believe everybody in this room has, but we're still going to do it. If we could pray together, because for anybody who's at home who, who is there as well, we'd like to give them that opportunity. So uh, let's pray this together. You can repeat after me. Lord, I realize I'm a sinner. And thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins. I recognize my need for forgiveness. And I surrender my life to you today. I accept Jesus into my heart as Lord and Savior. Please show me your will and help me become the person you want me to be. Thank you for saving me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. So we're believing that there's people out there who they're going to see this online today or they're going to see this in the future and that they are going to come to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus as Lord and Savior. If you're at home today and you've got any prayer requests, please go to reslifenewyork.org and put them in the prayer box there. And if you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior today, please let us know. You don't need to leave your name uh, if you want to or a phone number. We can get a hold of you. But uh, we thank you for attending at home. We thank you for attending here. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, pray for everybody if we just stand up. Before I pray, I just want to make an, make an announcement. As we know, um, things are changing. Um, our county is putting a mask mandate in as of m tomorrow. So when you come through the doors next Sunday, we're going to ask that everybody wear a mask. Throughout this week, in the middle of the week, you'll receive some notification at home as to what all that protocol is going to look like. Um, but right now, we want to know that everybody who enters the building is at least going to have a mask on, and there'll be more information to come. We want you to be able to make an informed decision, okay? So uh, 
We're just going to pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you do. Lord, I thank you for each individual who's here and has heard this today, Lord. And we ask that you, they put these, tr these truths to work, Lord. And we ask that you be the strength behind that, Lord. That they give you the glory and victory for what's going to take place in their storms and trials, Lord. We thank you for those who are in the midst, Lord. And we thank you for those who are in the waiting, Lord. And I ask that today's message resonate in those in the waiting, Lord. And that they start to prepare. Because the battle is real. But most importantly, we need to remember that you are the champion and you've already won. And we'll be sure to give you all the praise and honor and glory. So we thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week. Thank you for being here.